pray. Holy God, your mysteries surround and astound us each day. Send your Holy Spirit to open the mysteries of Scripture for us so that our understanding is refreshed, encouraged to follow Christ is renewed. Amen. So as we work our way through Jonah, the obvious question that we have to get through is whether or not one must believe that Jonah was literally in the belly of a big fish. I know you wanted to know that last week, and I kind of skirted it for you. Some people would argue that to claim any other reading than that Jonah was literally in the belly of the fish is false. And I'm not trying to convince those people that they are wrong when I say that I don't think you have to read it that way. The Bible is full of images. It's full of metaphors. In fact, if you look up the metaphor swallowed up in the Old Testament, you will find at least 40 instances of Israel and the people of Israel being swallowed up in various ways. Israel repeatedly goes its own way and then gets swallowed up by invaders, by famines, by earthquakes, by floods, by whatever, swallowed up. And then it gets turned around, spit back out, and put back on track over and over. That's the imagery the Old Testament uses. We need to embrace complexity when we read and recognize what we're reading. In this passage of Jonah, in verse 3, he says that God has hurled him into the deeps. But not 10 verses before, it was clearly the sailors who threw him off the boat. It can be both, and you can read it both ways. So I think whether you can or cannot believe that Jonah was actually literally swallowed and spent time in the belly of a fish is not that important. Jesus, when he talks about Jonah, says that he will be like Jonah. He says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But will he really be in the heart of the earth? Or is he placed in a shallow tomb? We can come to different conclusions about these things. And I think forcing us to pick isn't really helpful. The idea is that we spend three days and three nights, in other words, a pretty long time, in a dark, painful hole. And that's an experience I think a lot of people can relate to. Now, some people see pain in this life as proof that God doesn't exist. Or if he does, he's clearly not very good. I did a funeral years ago for a young guy who had passed away. And he had two young daughters and a young wife. And it was a staggering event because, you know, there's fire codes, right? You can only put so many people in a room. And we learned the hard way that day how many young girls can fit on a single pew. You would be amazed how small they actually are and how many people you could fit in this room. Our parking lot was overwhelmed. There was too many people. And somebody very quietly, they, were, they weren't being malicious, came up to me before the service. And he said, how, how can you possibly preach Christ or hope to these people? Like, what are you going to do here? This is an unmitigated tragedy. And he said it real gently, like he wasn't saying, how dare you get up there and do this? I think he was legitimately like, how in the world are you going to get up there and do this? And I told him, and I'm not the only one who thinks this, that it's exactly those moments when we need the gospel to be real. When those deep holes of darkness come, that's when you need to know that your current situation is not the end of the story. That's exactly when it matters the most. So if you're Jonah, 
in the belly of the fish, or you're someone in Ottawa and it's minus 42 out, you know it's going to end. Spring will come. The fish will spit you out. The second chapter of Jonah is largely there reminding us that our current situation does not prove our standing with God. For instance, despite what some people might say, if things are going really well in your life and you're driving a Porsche SUV and a Tesla, that does not make you blessed. And if things aren't going well, and the prayers are not being answered, and the diagnoses are not going away, that does not make you doomed. A lot of the Christian faith has to do with our circumstances not telling us how we're doing with God. But the love of Christ, at the, when we stand at the foot of the cross, his willingness to die from us, that is what tells us about our standing with God, regardless of what's going on in your life today. Some people, like I said, they argue bad things happen, that this is proof God doesn't exist. For example, I did a funeral once. This is a weird sermon full of funerals. I did a funeral once for a woman who was standing by the side of the road, waiting for the light to change. A cyclist had gone through the green light. He had the right of way. He had the green light. And a car had come and run a red light and hit him. He didn't die. He flew through the air like this, wearing a helmet, and he clocked this woman just so, and she died. And people say, God can't possibly exist, exist in this world when this stuff happens. These kind of things lead to families going into tailspin. We know this story, right? Divorce, addictions, anger, bitterness. And the atheist looks upon it and says to the Christian, where is your loving, powerful God in all of this? The technical term for that question is the Odyssey. It's very old. I think Jonah chapter 2 does something to answer it. It says that when things get rough, sometimes we start to think about where we have been, what we've been doing, where we're going, and we admit that we've missed the mark. The churches are not full these days, you know that, and often churches fill up with the following people. People come to church after they get divorced. People come to church after their child dies. They come when an existential crisis hits, when they finish school and don't know what to do, when they get married and after three months it turns out maybe it's harder than they thought, when they have kids, after a terrible diagnosis for them or a loved one. People have come to church after their child has been brought home by the police or when their mother's memory begins to fade. It's a very, very common. Few people win the lottery and show up at church that Sunday. Listen to Jonah. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Jonah is the same as you and I. When things get tough, he remembers the Lord. And he prays and he's heard. Jonah is hoping to go to Tarshish, probably hoping to have a good time. All of us are headed wherever we're headed, and we are also hoping to have a good time. Generally speaking, we get profoundly dissatisfied because the time is not as good as we had hoped. And then something small, this is the best, goes wrong, and we lose it. I don't know how much time you spend in airports. I have seen so many people at airports who have just had like a phenomenal vacation and some tiny thing goes wrong and it's like the vacation is wiped out. Back to square one. When the times are tough, that's when we have to pray. We pray for God to change things in our lives, to make things more like we were hoping for. But that's not quite what happens in Jonah, is it? 
Jonah is offering from the belly of a fish, whatever dark hole he's in, a prayer not to get out of the fish, but a prayer of thanksgiving. He says, I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise. He's in the pit. During the story, the other sailors, they were praying to their gods, right? They wanted saving. Jonah just stays quiet. He knew full well he was running away from God. He was being disobedient to God's will. And so in his own mind, he deserved whatever trouble God decided to send his way. And then God saves him anyways. Through his trials, he realizes he is lucky to even be alive. He will, as you know, if you've read it, become a petulant little prophet, and we'll get there, angry when God saves people he doesn't like. But here in the dark, smelly fish, he's thankful. He finds himself grateful during the most difficult moment in his life. Have you ever found yourself grateful in a difficult moment? When your kids are driving you absolutely crazy, did you ever stop and thank God that you have kids? Maybe say a prayer for your friends who can't. I, I never did. I'm being honest here. Like I, they just make me crazy. When your boss is being unreasonable, demanding more than you can ever accomplish. Do you ever stop and think you're grateful that you have a job and pray for someone who doesn't? Do you ever stop and remember how nervous you were when you went to the job interview or how excited you were when you first got that job? I don't. But the experience here in the biblical teaching is that it's important to find ways to be thankful in the pit. And part of it is to have an ongoing relationship with God, because then it's not just forced when you're not ready for it. Someone talks about meditating daily on God's word day and night. The idea is we have fortified over time, and then the, when the times get difficult, we instinctually will start to pray. Difficult times are going to come because there's not a person here who doesn't struggle with something. Some of us have bad tempers. Some of us are perpetually grumpy. Some of us are adulterous, at least in thought. Most of us are probably greedy and envious. Some of us are addicted to drugs, to alcohol, to gambling, pornography. Many of us are addicted to the salty, fatty, sugary food that we know we don't need to eat, but we will. We think that all of these things are under control, but we all know they're like a dam waiting to break, right? And if perfection is what is required, we are all going to fail. And that's where we're like Jonah. We know better than anybody else does. You know better than I do where you fall short of your expectations or of God's. Where you might think you deserve some kind of divine punishment. And so we become like Jonah before God, trusting God, not us. We're all like Jonah. We need to be saved from that. We understand the belly of the fish to be this disconnected from God, willfully headed in the opposite direction, what many would call the dark night of the soul, in which case we've all been there or will be. Do you remember this quote? I don't know if you'll hear, have heard this before from Kierkegaard. It's a great quote. It's a little bit long. The matter is quite simple. The Bible is easy to understand. But we Christians are a bunch of scheming swiddlers. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obliged to act accordingly. Take any words in the New Testament and forget everything except pledging yourself to act accordingly. My God, you will say, if I do that, my whole life will be ruined. How could I ever get in the world? Herein lies the real place of Christian scholarship. Christian scholarship is the church's prodigious invention to defend itself against the Bible, to ensure that we can continue to be good Christians without the Bible coming too close. Oh, priceless scholarship, 
what will we do without you? Dreadful it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, it is even dreadful to be alone with the New Testament. He's not actually anti-intellectual. He's trying to get us to read the Bible. Dreadful it is to read the Bible and think you have to live up to whatever is in there. Might as well be in the belly of a fish. Like, I, I can proclaim grace and preach the word endlessly, but none of us, if any, well, maybe, maybe somebody is, are going to get rid of our second or fifth coat. How many coats do you have? I got too many coats. I, I don't imagine many of us are turning the other cheek. And if we did, we'd get so proud of ourselves for having done so, we'd like be no further ahead, right? We're a lot like Jonah. When we take stock of ourselves and we reach the end of our robes, we face the coffin of the person who's died far too young, then we know our hope has to rest in God. It can't rest in us. We're not up for it. And Jonah is saved by God in the story. And all of us get saved by God, too, through Christ. Jonah is an archetype of us in some level, right? But Jesus is very clear. Jonah is also an archetype for him. Jesus is also on a mission from God. Unlike Jonah, he follows God's will no matter the personal cost. He walks through his own storm, the accusations of his elders, the abandonment of his friends, the lash of the whip, the crown of thorns, nails in his hands and his feet, suffocating. He dies, he spends three days in the dark like Jonah did. But with Jesus' time, it's different. Because where Jonah was sent to be a symbol to us, like a model we could see ourselves in and our need for help, Jesus is sent to be that help. He's sent as the one who's going to offer that salvation once and for all, so we don't need any fish anymore. He's going to have his three days in the dark, and he's going to be resurrected from it. It's changing the course of history. Closes the gap between us and God. His resurrection makes it possible for us to look at our lives and see where we have failed honestly, where we've gone wrong, and to recognize we're going to go wrong again and again and again, and it's okay because our hope is in Christ, not in us, and at the end of the day, we're going to be welcomed at his table. Jesus accomplished on the cross what he accomplishes rising from the tomb. It's once and for all, and it means that before God, we come with thanksgiving, even when it's minus 42. Even when the times are tough, because Jesus knows what it's like to go through those difficulties. To go through the darkness, to walk in this seemingly endless tunnel where there's not light in front or behind or anywhere around you. He walked the path alone, and then he promised to walk it with us. You see, the core of the Christian faith is the suffering servant, the one who knows what it was to be betrayed, the one who understands darkness. And when it's coming, when it's just on the horizon, he throws a dinner party with his friends. He knows he's about to walk through all that, and he invites them all over, and he says, we're going to have a feast, and it's going to remind you of the feasts to come. You're about to go through a difficult, dark time, and you're going to have to have something to sustain you. The suffering Christ is the glory of God. There's a passage you probably know from Isaiah, we're almost done, that I think answers this question really well, because if you, if you attack Christianity for the inability to respond to pain in the world, you haven't understood what Christianity is expressing. We follow Christ, and this is the description. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, 
a man of suffering and familiar with pain. This is describing Christ. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah says that way before Jesus spends his three days and three nights. Jonah suffered, and we suffer, and most importantly, Jesus also suffered. So now when we do, we know we're not alone in it. We know it's not the end of the story. We know that the story goes on. He is why I can stand in front of a room full of people that's beyond the fire code and talk about hope. He's why each of you can face the challenges of the day. So in a few minutes, we will come to the table. We will celebrate grace and love. We will celebrate with thanksgiving. Regardless of how cold it is outside or what dark night of the soul we've been in or think we're going to be in in the next year. No matter what is going on in our lives, we, like Jonah, can be strengthened by God in the belly of the whale. And it doesn't have to be a whale. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you walk alongside us. Lord, we don't thank you for the suffering and the pain that's in our lives. We don't thank you for the suffering and the pain that we cause. But we thank you for your ability to redeem it. We thank you for your ability to draw us closer to you, even in dark times. Lord, we pray that we would be drawn ever closer to you. And that as we come to this table, Lord, whatever needs we have, you would meet. That we could be your people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.